Hello and welcome to this A-level physics video on ultrasound which is going to talk about how ultrasound is produced, typical wavelengths used in the body and how different types of scans are produced and what information they give and how they build up a picture of the organs in the body. Okay so ultrasound is just exactly that, it's sound that is higher than human hearing, so ultrasound, higher than sound. Now the limit of human hearing in terms of the frequency is 20,000 Hz, so ultrasound is actually any sound that is of higher frequency than 20,000 Hz. But in ultrasound scanning uh, we use a frequency much higher than that, typically around 2 MHz. And what we do is we send pulses of this high frequency uh, sound, a high frequency pressure wave, into the patient's body and then we listen for the reflections coming off the boundaries between different types of tissue, so between muscle and bone for example. And all that's done with pulses of ultrasound. Now if you want to work out the wavelength of the ultrasound of let's say a 2 megahertz ultrasound signal, we can use our classic wave equation down here V equals F lambda. So the wavelength can be calculated from using the velocity and dividing through by the frequency. So let's say for example that the tissue in question has uh, a speed of sound in that tissue of about 1500 meters per second and we could divide that by the frequency and we'll use the frequency given up there 2 megahertz 2 times 10 to the 6 hertz okay and when you do that you get a, a wavelength of 0.75 millimeters okay so it's quite small uh, wavelengths for this particular frequency. Now if you the smaller wavelength you use the better resolution you can get because if you're imaging things with waves you can normally image objects of a similar size to the wavelength and no smaller. That's one of the reasons why they use electron mi mi microscopes to image very very small things because the wavelength of electrons is very very small indeed. So we can image things with um, ultrasound of two, 2 megahertz down to something less than a millimeter resolution. But the trade-off is that short wavelengths don't penetrate the body very well. Longer wavelengths penetrate further into the body. So if you want depth in your ultrasound scan, you need to use slightly longer wavelength waves. And if you want resolution, you need to use shorter wavelength waves. So there's an optimal wavelength which is around about this sort of, this sort of amount. Okay, so how are the ultrasound pulses produced? Well, this is uh, done with, with using um, a, what we call a piezoelectric crystal. Now, the piezoelectric crystal uses the effect called the piezoelectric effect, um, and the various crystals um, can actually use this effect. And how it works is, I'll just get a blank page here. Um, if, we, if we have a look at a part of the crystal, is a natural crystal or possibly sometimes um, a synthetic crystal. Quartz is a good example of a, of a piezoelectric material. Here are the uh, molecules very simplistically drawn in the crystal and the molecules are actually polarized so they will have their own electric polarization. One side of the molecule will be naturally negative in charge and one will be positive, one side will be positive. So they have this sort of polarization. And what we can then do is we can apply a potential difference across the sides or the ends of the crystal. Now if we apply a potential difference which is negative on this side and positive on this side, the effect of that will be that the, the polarization of the molecule being positive on this side will be repelled by this positive plate and this will push the molecules in that direction. And similarly, on this side, with the negative uh, electrode, if you like, that will be that will repel this negative side of the crystal, which will push it in that direction. And the net effect of this, of course, is that the crystal will actually shrink in size due to the electric field that's been placed across it. So if we then reverse the polarization, or the, or the polarity rather, of the potential difference, and we put a positive potential difference and a negative potential there, um, that will have the opposite effect. So the negative ends, if you like, of the polarized uh, molecules will be attracted to the positive electrode and vice versa down here. 
and so that will have the effect of stretching the crystal. Now instead of just a fixed potential difference, if we connect that to an alternating potential difference, where it goes positive, 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 positive across the both plates one after the other, that will have the effect of making the crystal vibrate. All right, so it will physically move in, out, in, out, in both directions, um, and that will cause the, the crystal to be compressed and then expand, be compressed and then expand. So the crystal vibrates, and we can use that as uh, because obviously that will then cause sound waves to be sent out in this direction, which will then be sent into the body. So the piezoelectric crystal, the vibration of it, is used to send the pulses into the body. And we can do this at whatever frequency we like, and we choose a frequency around about um, 2 megahertz. So effectively, that's what we're doing. Now the piezoelectric effect is a reversible process. So if we apply a voltage like we've just described, that will have the effect of putting the crystal under strain and compressing it and expanding it. And that is how we send out the pulses. Okay, so the pulses are sent out in this way. But the pulses are then reflected off body tissue and they come back in towards the transducer, the piezoelectric transducer. And as they do so, coming back in, they, the pulses will force the vibration of the crystal itself and that stress across it will induce an EMF across the crystal's sides. So the, the positive and negative potentials here are induced by the vibration of the crystal. So that's the opposite process of what we had here. We can apply a voltage to make it vibrate or if it vibrates because of an incoming pulse it will induce um, an alternating EMF across the sides which we can then measure and the amount of vibration will depend or rather the induced EMF will depend on the amount of vibration. So we can we can transmit the pulses into the body with the piezoelectric crystal and we can also receive the pulses as they come back from the body with the same crystal. So the crystal can be used as a transceiver, a transmitter and a receiver of the ultrasound pulses. So that's quite a clever way to do it and that's that's how it's done. So the voltage is applied and then it's measured as the as the uh, as the ultrasound pulse comes back to the transducer. Okay, so the transducer is here, this little blue strip here, and it's placed inside a housing, uh, which includes some acoustic insulators to stop the the signal because what we don't want is the signals coming back this way because the body is over here. So we what we want is the signals to be sent out in this direction. So we have to prevent any vibration of the housing and that's done by this backing block which is a, an, an acoustic insulator as well as the casing around it. So there are no vibrations from the operator's hand for example or from the air around uh, which will affect the signal. Um, the, the nose of the transducer housing here is plastic um, and it acts as a, a bit of an acoustic lens to focus the ultrasound uh, rays uh, waves, sorry, the pulses in into the body. Okay, so that's the transducer. So how does ultrasound actually give you an image? Okay, so it's based on the ideas that you've seen before of refraction and reflection. So this is uh, the refraction of light and here comes an incident light beam towards this surface here, this interface or boundary. We've got air on this side and glass on this side. I'm sure you've seen this diagram before. Some of the light will be transmitted and refracted into the next layer, into the glass, and some of the light will be reflected from this surface. Uh, and the proportions of these depend on um, the refractive indices of these two things and, and, and whatever. Now, this is obviously an angle here. There's an angle of incidence. We're only interested in rays that come, or waves, sound waves in our case, that come down along the normal line. So, in, to put that into context, down here we've got an incident pulse which is coming into this boundary. This, is, this black line here is a boundary between two different tissues. This top tissue may be muscle, perhaps, and this one down here may be bone, for example. So, the pulse comes in. Part of that intensity of the pulse is transmitted and part of it is reflected. And what we're interested in is the fraction of the intensity the fraction of the initial intensity that is reflected here. And that fraction depends on the 
acoustic impedance of the two materials. Okay, now the acoustic impedance is given the symbol Z, and Z, the acoustic impedance, is equal to rho. Rho is the density of the material, and C, which is the speed of the ultrasound in that, in that particular type of material. So if you multiply the density by the speed of sound in that material, you get the acoustic impedance. And the proportion of reflected intensity is calculated by doing this little fancy sum here with the two acoustic impedances, where Z2 is the lower layer and Z1 is the upper layer of material. So the, the fraction of the incident intensity that is reflected at this particular boundary will be equal to Z2 minus Z1, all squared, over Z2 plus Z1, all squared. So let's have a closer look. Let's have a look at the units of Z first. So in order to find the units of Z, we just combine the units of the things that are multiplied together to find it. So it's density, which is kilograms per cubic meter, multiplied by speed, which is meters per second. So the units of density are a combination of those, which is kilograms, meters minus two, seconds minus one. Okay, so that's the unit of acoustic impedance. Kilograms, meters minus two, seconds minus one. Let's have a little bit of practice doing this, uh, this one of these examples here. So if we look at the acoustic impedance of muscle, we find that the average acoustic impedance of muscle is 1.71 times 10 to the 6 kilograms, meters minus 2, seconds minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to put M there for muscle. And the acoustic impedance of bone is 6.40 times 10 to the 6 kilograms meters minus 2 seconds minus 1 and I'm going to put that B for bone. So if you just have a look at this um, try putting those into that equation there and try and come up with an answer. Obviously you're going to get a, a ratio, a fraction of the reflected to the incident intensity and this is going to be unitless because these units all cancel out so you're just going to get a number. Okay so you can stop the video while you do that if you like. Um, and when you do that, the, uh, the answer comes out to 0.33. So about a third of the incident intensity is reflected on the muscle to bone boundary. Okay. So this is where we come to the actual images themselves. So if you've got a large difference between acoustic impedance between top layer and the bottom layer, um, this means that the boundary will show up very well and here's an ultrasound image of a, a fetus inside a, a mother's uterus and you can see that there are very bright areas here where the bones are and there's a lot of bone around here in the face so that's obviously going to be a bright material here. There's nothing here because this is fluid and you can see that there the boundary is a very bright boundary there. So the acoustic impedances are very different between this this part here with the fluid, the amniotic fluid, and the fetus's body. This bit up here is, is the muscle wall of the mother's stomach. So large differences in acoustic impedance give you large amounts of reflection, and small differences give you not very much reflection at all. So you're going to get contrast. So the thing that gives you contrast in uh, an ultrasound image is the differences in acoustic impedance. Now one of the issues with um, differences in, in acoustic impedance is at the skin because the, effectively you're, you're sending ultrasound from the actual scanner through maybe a little bit of air and then into, onto skin and there's a huge difference in the acoustic impedance there. So we need to match the impedance in order to get good transmission into the body and the way we do that is by using the gel that, you, that is so typically found in ultrasound scans. Um, the gel has a very very close acoustic impedance to that of skin. So because the two acoustic impedances are almost identical, uh, because the gel is manufactured that way, you get very good transmittance and hardly any reflection at the skin. And in fact by using gel you guarantee that about 99.5 percent of the ultrasound is transmitted into the body rather than being reflected at the surface of the body which is really what you don't want. 